of tuner. 528 hertz. I wonder if we can see 528 hertz. If we can see sound, if we can see the sound of love, or if we can see love and speak love through direct perception. No idea. I feel like self-dialogue is real science. We think science is working for 10 years on one paper that most people can't understand. Whereas if we can speak with ourselves and develop direct perception of things, we don't really need science. There's a different type of science called science, S-C-E-Y-E, N-C-E. -E. It's the science of the eyes, of seeing, of seeing clearly, and we can also hypothesize also spelt with E-Y-E. -E. It's a way of humanizing information within oneself versus how we try to absorb things mechanically and turn ourselves into mechanisms through scientific facts. There's the facts we can see with our own eyes if we're not blinded by our mechanized thought process. I skimmed through an article by Dr. Mercola and he's talking about the importance of movement and I talked about this before and he talks about it a lot because it's one of his main things is movement and he says that if we're not moving there's BNF in the brain which is bone neurotropic factor or something like that and if we're moving there's actually something in the brain they discovered through rat studies called noggin so noggin makes the brain cells grow, whereas BNF makes the brain atrophy. So he's saying exercise is actually important for brain growth. And it's interesting because if we're sedentary, we're gonna have more BNF in our body, we're gonna grow more bone tissue because our bones actually start to fuse together when we're not moving. And if we're sitting with our head forward all day long and we're not moving, it's going to fuse so it makes sense that we have this bone generation factor in our blood if we're sedentary but it's in our blood so it's also in the blood in our brain so in that way being sedentary actually makes our brain atrophy just because we're not moving so in movement we're able to produce more brain cells, but I actually feel partly it's due to the fact there's more circulation. So when we're sedentary, there's no circulation, we grow bones. Whereas if we're moving, we don't need those extra bone supports because we're fluid, we're dynamic, we're meant to move. And I also extrapolate this to actually how our brain cells move. So if we're thinking the same repetitive thoughts, 60,000 thoughts a day, there might only be 100 thoughts on repeat, we're doing the equivalent of remaining stationary in our mind because we're stationary within those 100 thoughts. So how I relate this is to when I've talked about how the ego is actually scar tissue, it's actually thoughts we keep repeating, 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 and it forms scar tissue. And we have very limited movement in terms of where our brain can go in order to think and see, because we're only seeing and thinking along the lines of our repetitive thoughts. So to me, exercise would increase movement, which increases blood flow, which allows the brain to grow. So that's physical exercise. I feel it's just as critical to actually be able to move the brain cells in many different ways, not just in the hundred thoughts that the brain thinks. Those few thoughts that we've used to clog up the RAM of our pre 
prefrontal cortex and it's just going over and over. The brain has lost its fluidity. It has become rigid, rigid in its thinking. And it's not even thinking. It's just going along the same tracks that it's laid down through conditioning. And we see something, we remember it, we repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Whatever it is that we repeat in our own voice becomes this habitual thought track that prevents us from seeing other things. It prevents us from seeing. And so what I'm saying is that seeing perception, seeing something new is a different movement that grows the brain. It actually provides oxygen to some other area of the brain because we just saw something. Even Dr. Bruce Lipton says perception writes genetics. So seeing something is going to change something genetically in the brain to, to create different brain cells, to create different neurons. So we're either moved by our conditioning through a very limited habit track and then we think oh we need to create a few more habits or we don't have those habits of thought and we can see clearly everything and when we can see clearly everything that everything is recreated and mirrored in our brain cells and when our brain cells are growing we have energy we're learning we're engaged and that is joy love beauty happiness so the real thing is actually being able to see something new and see something anew, to see with new eyes. It's not about doing anything, it's about seeing with new eyes because I could say, well, I'm gonna do this and this is my plan. These are the seven steps to this habit. And then I do that and that actually puts blinders on or I see the falseness of that process and just see and perceive in the present moment. If we walk in a distorted way, and we continue to walk that way for the next 30 years, we're gonna be stuck that way, we're gonna be scarred that way, we're gonna be distorted that way. Whereas if we move dynamically, and we're always moving infinitely differently, through the full range of motions of our body as a human being within the field of gravity and understanding that field of gravity that we're in, our bodies are going to continue to be dynamic and fluid. They're not going to fuse. So same thing with thinking the same thoughts all the time. The brain fuses and congeals and then we are very limited in the way that we can move about in the field of thought, in the field of consciousness. I feel the new game is actually to grow our brain cells, to work out our brain cells, and to make that also embodied. So growing our brain cells could include things like seeing something new. It could include getting more oxygen by being in the forest, for example. Seeing nature, which is more beautiful than looking at a screen all the time. Doing things that get the oxygen to the brain. I feel like ego thoughts actually starve the whole brain of oxygen. It sends it all to the prefrontal cortex and forms these scar tissues of neurons in there, abstracting about the same thing all the time and just living in those abstractions and not seeing reality. And reality is the whole brain. It's reflected in the whole brain. So we have to see with our whole brain, not just our abstractions about reality. And part of how we make it embodied is by having conversation and communication with other people and the epigestratics and the endomimetics and the epimimetics and making weems. So making the oxytocin through the inner human dimensions because the oxytocin is what actually we have the love feeling in the brain and then we get it also in the body whereas dopamine is just in the brain from what I've read so far and the oxytocin makes us want to gesture with our body it makes us want to reach out and continue it's a different reward it's a reward of connection as opposed to dopamine which is a reward of disconnection and then we get more and more and more disconnected and then we walk to a path where we're so scarred by our own 
thinking process and we take ourselves to be that, that some of us end our lives. I feel like the ego kills itself when the brain is that starved of oxygen that it can't see anything else. It's not oxygenating the rest of the brain. It can't see anything else but itself and its abstraction. And, and it goes so far into that that that's all it can see and it sees the meaninglessness of it and then that's the end. If a person can see beauty, they're not going to end their life. If a person can feel love, and these are things to do with oxytocin and connection, and earthing, connecting with the earth and sunshine also gets the blood flowing. I'm seeing a lot about this whole blood flow thing. It's almost like what we see is where the blood flow is directed in the brain. We're only seeing our abstractions. It's, it's too directed to the prefrontal cortex. And then we say we use 5% of our brain because all of the blood supply is going to these, this abstracting process, this distracting process. It's distracting the blood flow from the rest of the brain. And then no wonder there's all these neurodegenerative diseases now where the brain is basically shriveling up. It's not getting any nutrition. Even the movie What the Bleep Do We Know, which was years ago, said that we become addicted to our emotions in our body and then we have more receptors for those emotions than we do nutrients. So we're so busy giving the cells those emotions that that is taking up the capacity to actually absorb the nutrition because there's more receptors for the emotion than the actual molecules of nutrition. And I think the same thing happens in the brain with dopamine. Everything's going to that reflex, so the rest of the brain isn't being nourished. The body down-regulates everything in favor of this dopamine because the brain is a perceptual apparatus, but we're only perceiving things that are giving the reward of dopamine. And then the rest of the brain, there's no energy going there. And so through this dopamine process, which eventually becomes dopamineingless, the me Seeing the meaninglessness of it all sometimes ends itself through destroying the body. The brain has been destroyed, so the body gets destroyed too. I wrote something down. I wrote down that perception, which is light, and minerals are frequencies of light, leads to movement in the brain, which leads to blood flow, which leads to oxygen, which leads to energy. So perception is what unfolds life. And we don't even see what we're doing to ourselves. So why do we think we can see what the cosmos is doing? And sometimes we're released from seeing through that ego me process and we can kind of see what the cosmos is doing. It's pretty amazing. And the cosmos is playing with life and we're destroying it. And I think about again, what would a manic do? What would I do if I had nothing to do? And I was thinking about, at some point, doing an experiment where I go out and I just have nothing to do. I just leave the house and I just go based on intuition for the whole day. Because that's something that a manic would do. Because normally we follow our thought processes and our habits. So if those are the things that are obstructing us in a lot of ways, how can I just go out and just be like a manic person would and just sort of follow one's heart? And the thing with that is, is then we have to actually pay attention. We have to pay attention to our heart. We have to pay attention to what we're perceiving. And in a way, this is a way to deprogram our movement in the field of gravity and space and time has become mechanical based on our programmed thoughts and then we don't see anything. So if we go out without habit, we're looking for life. We actually have to respond to life and see that life creates life and that we are alive. And I can use an app to track where I go, kind of like how those studies track cats and where they go at night. 
let perception move you. That could be a fundamental thing. Let perception move you. I don't know. And activating this other voice, this voice of intelligence, as opposed to the voice of the ego, which is words turned against us. Being able to utilize words to create the brain, to create brain cells, as opposed to create scar tissue in the brain through repetition. And even though repetition builds muscles in the field of gravity, repeating thoughts in the field of consciousness actually limits neural connections. The muscle cells are designed to get stronger, whereas brain cells are designed to get more complex. So for repeating, we're actually going against complexity. And gratitude probably increases blood flow to the brain. Right now, the highest quality for watching and recording things is 4K. And I had this thought that right now we're actually playing in C squared. Light, the speed of light squared times mass or love as Einstein said we're playing in C squared which is a holographic process we're playing in the light of the Sun meets the light of our eyes the light of our consciousness what do we watch in C squared is more important than having the best 4k TV what do we create in C squared? How do we arise in C squared? How do we make our brain grow within C squared? I feel like relationship heals in that it brings in another C, it brings in another light of consciousness. So it depends how that person is shining the light of their consciousness, it will actually change you. If somebody's judging you, you can tell, especially in map consciousness. Whereas if they're being unconditionally loving, you can also tell. And it changes your light. In mania, we often become very graceful. We're more fluid, we're more flexible, we're stronger. We move differently. And I feel like it's because that energy in our brain isn't being directed to the prefrontal cortex. It's not being directed to the ego. And when it's not being directed there, all of a sudden we shift to being this very dynamic and fluid version of ourselves and it doesn't take time it's just a matter of shift in awareness so map consciousness is a shift in awareness it's a shift in perception we're not perceiving through that limited energy of the ego structure and when we are perceiving through that that is what contracts our body and condenses it and gets us moving as we would as our ego version of ourselves so it's actually just a matter of energy flow it's a matter of perception which changes the flow of energy so it's a matter of changing how we look changing how we see with our eyes and it's just a matter of seeing something new which doesn't seem that difficult it's making a new connection making a new connection that's what extrapolation is so today when I read that Mercola article I probably only read a few sentences and when I did, I extrapolated. And so that might be more important than actually sitting and reading the whole long article and trying to absorb what they're saying is thinking of something new about what they're saying and maybe just reading a sentence or two. And not worrying about whether it's right or wrong. Because right or wrong, reward and punishment, that's all dopamine. And that's the thing we're actually trying to decouple from in map consciousness we don't feel that sense of reward and punishment we just feel like we're learning and then when we come back to ego consciousness we feel that sense of reward and punishment oftentimes amplified it's almost like how dare you not believe in reward and punishment now we're going to punish you the answer is to question the programming to see the programming and by seeing the programming those are the new eyes Instead of seeing as the programming, seeing the programming. Seeing that we're not that programming, that there's a dimension beyond. 
we have those degrees of freedom. By labeling us with mental illnesses, our brains are sold to the pharmaceutical industry. We're given the inner subjective experience in map consciousness so we can feel powerful, so we can feel the power of our own brains. Our brains are so powerful. It's connecting us with our inner superhero. And it probably only feels like superhero because we're not used to being like that. We felt like superheroes as kids, probably. And then we go back to feeling like superheroes. And it's just a feeling. Maybe the world would be a better place if more of us felt like that. If we didn't feel so disempowered. If our brains weren't so fried by the circuitry of repetition. Most things out there are giving us something to strive for. But we don't question the thing we're striving with. We're striving with this brain that's polluted and clogged with old thoughts and programs. I was thinking about gestures, and it's not the gesture, but it's also the perception of the gesture and the meaning of. So if I do a kind gesture but nobody sees it, it's not going to be perceived and the meaning's not going to be equated. Or if I do a gesture that's not culturally appropriate, some other culture sees that as a bad gesture, then there's also a miscommunication there. So map consciousness is trying to get us to produce new gestures and it could just be the gesture of being dynamic and being not programmed. Non-programmed gestures as opposed to programmed gestures. And creating new gestures, which is epigesturetics. Because no amount of arranging thoughts in our head is going to solve the world's problems. We actually have to act. And it's actually getting us to act and act dynamically. And in map consciousness, the light of our awareness can be directed anywhere instead of being directed to our dopamine circuits. And when that light can be directed anywhere, we can see. And map consciousness causes voice reversal. Instead of speaking from this internal voice, we're speaking from our perceptions. We're speaking from what we see. We speak from what we see instead of what we me. We don't know how to turn off autopilot. So one thing would be to notice when we are on autopilot. And when we notice we're on autopilot, we're no longer on autopilot. And MAP is trying to use atrophied areas of the brain. So if I was immobilized for 20 years, it would take me a long time to learn how to walk and get those muscles built again with blood flow. And ego consciousness is the same. It's like immobilizing most of our brain. So in a way, map consciousness is actually learning how to walk. Learning how to walk in a different world instead of a world of our own thoughts. And we need to actually move differently physically in order to walk in that world too. We can't move in habitual ways. So sometimes in map consciousness we fall over and it's like laying down again. But we can still get up and try again and practice. And this isn't a practice in terms of building a habit, it's a practice of not practicing. A practice of not being on autopilot, of not being a habit. Being a habit would be like, I'm gonna make the habit of always saying, donkeys are gray and horses are brown every time I meet up with somebody. So if somebody came up to me and said, hey, how are you doing? Donkeys are gray, horses are brown. We would never try to mechanize what we say to people, so why do we try to mechanize anything else in life? This perception is a different movement. It moves the brain differently. It moves us differently when we can actually see. Perception causes movement. I've never recorded in 4K. I didn't even notice that setting. So I'm just going to try it, but I guess I shouldn't do a long video. But I realized that, in a way, self-dialogue is like talking oneself out of one's ego. Talking oneself as a different self, from a different perspective, about different perspectives, instead of just one's own limited perspective, creates those other brain cells. 
and then in dialogue with each other we might actually see that we're one consciousness we're not separate another benefit of self dialogue I thought of is that when I do self dialogue I generally get up get dressed put on a bit of makeup whereas some of those days I might not have done that if I wasn't talking to myself and thinking that maybe I would share it one day so I think it's beneficial to do that I feel like I have a purpose even if that day I don't have anything to do and the purpose is just to communicate just to communicate with myself in a different way as opposed to yada 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 and so mania I feel grows the brain it's light training it's a different form of exercise the light of perception light is what actually grows brain cells seeing something which is light but seeing something new will create new brain cells just like when the cell perceives something via a receptor on its membrane there's a cascade of changes in the cell there's different DNA transcribed or it'll even produce DNA based on what it's perceiving if it doesn't have the DNA for that and Dr. Bruce Lipton talks about genetic engineering genes which can actually write new DNA based on the perception of the environment. Well our brains can write new brain cells based on the perception of the environment but if we're perceiving abstractions it's just going to create brain cells for abstracting the prefrontal cortex. It's not going to create the whole cortex. Abstraction is division. It divides us. It's division. It gets rid of our vision. And the oneness is vision. We all share this external reality, supposedly. We just don't share the same bodies, but everything else we share. So technically, we have access to the exact same vision. But we're living in our abstractions, which are division. We don't share that part. Those are personal. We make life personal when it's not personal. It's all non-personal. And so the level of consciousness is the level of perception. It's the level of light. And we need to perceive at those higher levels, perceive love in order to grow the brain cells of love, to mirror that in our brains. And map consciousness gives us that blueprint. It gives us that visual blueprint, that whole brain visual blueprint. It's a different game with different rules, not reward and punishment, which is programmed into our dopamine reflex. It could be called love and create or love and learn love and learn that's the new game we're looking for more content but we don't question how we see I would say that the brain creates matter I had this insight because I realized perception through the brain creates matter so for example if I have a if I have an insight into nature and I'm looking at a tree, I might plant a tree, which creates matter. So my brain, as life, as perception, can facilitate that matter unfolding or being created. And the same life force that grows the brain is the same life force that grows the tree. So it's that life force. So are we perceiving that life force and co-creating with it? Or are we destroying life? in favor of and even further there could be other matter out there that we don't perceive but if we have a higher level of consciousness we could perhaps perceive that matter and then that matter is made manifest through the perception of it so it's not only perceiving the necessity of trees and then planting one and and seeing that matter get transformed but we can probably transform other unseen things into the seen world that are there we just can't see and think about dark matter and dark energy it could just be dark because we don't have the brain cells to perceive it 
but we have to be looking for something new. We have to be looking for something different. We have to be looking for something the next level beyond the thing we just saw. We can never say, oh, this is it. It's never it. We can say, oh, that's nice. What's next? But not this is it. There's no ultimate anything. Learning is infinite. And if we realize that, we would have never stopped learning. I feel our separative actions lead to our decline. So our ego is sort of our dopamine, is our personal reward, is our personal pleasure. Me, me, me. And oxytocin is we. It requires some kind of connection in order to release oxytocin. And because we think in our separate ways, we don't think together. We need to start thinking together and seeing things together and extrapolating together. And I doubt dopamine and oxytocin can coexist. So if we're in our dopamine structures of separation, we're not creating oxytocin, we're not creating connection. So then we feel disconnected. And just like people say the most important thing for their health and longevity is relationships, it's part of that, part of that is oxytocin. It keeps our brains connected to our bodies. And when we're connected to our bodies, we can see, we can, we can relate, we can make gestures, we can reach out. We feel connected so we can reach out and make connections. And going into personal bliss is the same thing as going towards death. Look at what's happening with all this fentanyl crisis. The person who dies, dies in a very blissful state, personal bliss. They probably go into like enlightenment for however long and then they're dead. Like that's a pathway to enlightenment for sure, but it's not one that is embodied. It's not one that's connected. Enlightenment can be a disembodied state. Enlightenment is death. One gets to that light and goes probably into the light body realm, but it disconnects one from one's physical body. So oxytocin, released from the brain, going into the body is a connection of love of the brain to the body. And it's the brain loving the body and the body loving the brain, and that both are instruments of love and perception. And learning, and actually it could be the brain learning how to love, the brain learning how to release oxytocin and for us to become an oxytocin dominant culture. And those are the measures of wellness, not one's personal bank account. So it seems the brain unfolds matter. If we live in abstraction, that's what we see in front of us and it's not really matter, it's sort of an image. Whereas if we're living in actuality and perceiving with that, we're really in touch with the matter of the universe and we can actually unfold that matter and it could be that 95% is dark energy because 95% of us are are living in 5% of our brain which is the prefrontal cortex so the rest of what's out there in actuality is invisible because we're living in that invisible realm we're living in the world of images and abstractions so today in the shower I had an insight about possible hypotheses for other biological phenomena. I feel like one of the mechanisms of medication, some medications for mental illness could be actually that it stops blood flow to the brain. It stops the blood flow to the whole brain. Maybe it continues to direct it to the prefrontal cortex. And I've previously talked about how it's kind of like a chemical ego band-aid. So stopping the blood flow to the other parts of the brain is stopping the brain growth. It's stopping the brain from outgrowing the ego. It's stopping the brain from having that energy to transcend the ego. And I feel like that could actually be why a lot of people on those meds get diabetes and strokes and heart attacks is because it's messing with blood flow. So Dr. Mercola talked to that doctor who said that 
he was talking about blood flow and and things like that and and I was thinking about it wouldn't just be those medications but blood flow is impeded in general in a lot of conditions perhaps and these are just my hypotheses I'm not saying these are true or science or there could be studies about this I don't know but I feel like there's something to do with in diabetes that there's not proper blood flow to the pancreas so it's possible that the trouble is that it, it can't bind insulin because it can't get blood flow so it becomes unable to really produce and secrete insulin or bind insulin because there's no blood flow to the the pancreas there's no blood communication and I was thinking about how people then inject insulin into their fat cells and it could actually be a way for the body because generally a lot of people who inject insulin they they end up gaining a lot of weight and it could be the way for the body to actually distribute the insulin through the fat cells and through the lymphatic system bypassing the blood system because the blood flow to the pancreas has been reduced through say psych meds or it could also be that when there's too much sugar and and all these processed chemicals that could actually mess up the blood flow to the pancreas it could almost maybe reduce the blood flow to the pancreas because the pancreas is so overactive that it almost sets up this like autoimmune reaction not in terms of inflammation as much but in terms of the fact that blood flow can't get there or it chooses almost not to go there anymore and then people with diabetes sometimes end up with their limbs amputated and it could be that there's this blood flow problem to the limbs because the lymphatic fluid is like pooling and there's insulin in the lymphatic system instead of in the blood and then basically it's a blood flow problem so really it's a lot of things could actually just be blood flow problems problems with the capillaries and people who gain weight often are less active and then that just actually compounds the problem and movement is important for the brain too the movement of perception perception moving around the visual field perception not from the focal view but also from the peripheral vision and being able to see from other perspectives being able to see a map consciousness is using our eyes differently to unfold something different to see something different and we go into that field of unseen that we see but nobody else can see it so it's a matter of having other people able to see this whole living movement of life which is right there that we're all living in but we don't see because we're stuck in five percent of the field which is habit our energy and our attention is being consumed by the machine of habit and thought and mania breaks us away from that in order to act differently to create something different to create as we would when we're fully alive it changes our way of being because it changes our way of seeing and when we can see clearly we don't need programs and we don't need habits programs prevent seeing clearly and I actually feel like one of the troubles in map consciousness is that we are seeing so clearly and we're not part of the program but we're interacting with people who are programmed so how do we engage in dialogue in order to exist as living beings together not as two programs butting heads can't talk long today because I'm going out I'm going ice skating yay yesterday I made my own certificate through the mental health system I've got little certificates for this little education class and that little education class and created my own and maybe I'll create more but this one says certificate of trans consciousness 
This certifies that Womanic Wonder Whore has successfully labeled herself Shit Disturber in Chief. Signed, The Universe. So I'm not sure. So this certificate is mainly about labeling, creating my own label to unfold my life. Shit Disturber in Chief. And I also gave myself an alter ego name. Womanic Wonder Whore. So woman, I see, as in manic, and wonder whore. Because I'm a whore of wonder, I'm always wondering. And it's also a play on words that a lot of women are just thought to be whores and I'm just gonna re-own that word. Last night I had a dream and I don't remember dreams very often or I don't dream very often, but I dreamt that I was hanging out with two bears and we were even like rustling around and playing around. And then later in the dream I was on a street and this bald guy was running towards me and I sort of effortless I just realized who the bald guy is. But I grabbed his hand and I effortlessly swung him in a circle and then threw, let go and he sort of skidded along the ground and hit his head on the side of the sidewalk. And I think I wrote somewhere once that the bear is my power animal. And I wasn't sure about that, and I couldn't find where I typed it, but maybe it is my power animal. And I wonder if the most important thing is the light coming out of our eyes. The quality of that light, the consciousness of that light, that might be what is healing. So it could be about, can I look with love in this situation? And maybe a good practice would be to put things in front of us that we can love unconditionally. And maybe that's where we can actually stop the need to focus. Because when we're focusing, we're looking for something. But when we've found the something that we're looking for, we don't need to focus anymore. We just relax and enjoy. We don't need to do, we don't need to strive. And what we're looking for is the thing by which we look, which is looking with unconditional love. So if we're not at a place yet where we can look with unconditional love, our focus is going everywhere and, and we're saying, well, we can't focus because we're going everywhere. The path of least resistance is to look at that which we can love unconditionally and then expand the range if we choose to, if we want to focus on other things, if there are other things that we actually do want to do once we find that which we can look at with unconditional love. Maybe those are the friends that are the best, the ones that we can look at with unconditional love, that we can just be around, that we're not judging and dividing ourselves from, we're just enjoying, we're just relaxed. I was thinking about how in Sean Blackwell's videos, in one of them he talks about how when slavery still existed, if a slave ran away, the slave was said to have a mental illness with some kind of name related to a slave running away. And I feel like map consciousness 
trans consciousness is similar. It's consciousness or the brain becoming aware that it's a psychological slave, that it's a slave to its thoughts and and it tries to move away from that. The thought process has changed and one is moving into the new and moving away from the old. And that other consciousness tries to get us to move away from ourselves and society. And then when we're captured, we're called mentally ill. We're labeled as mentally ill when really we've just seen that we're slaves to our psychology. A slave would have an advantage because they know they're a slave, whereas we don't even realize that we're slaves of our psychology. Consciousness is trying to free us from the slavery of thought. The slavery of thought that keeps us wandering around in a very small f portion of the field of reality and we feel like we're free, but we're not. And mania is a brain hack. The universe is hacking into our brains. Instead of the thoughts and the me thinking through the brain, it's the universe thinking through the brain. And that's a different energy filtering through it than the limited energy of thought. It's trying to free us from that. My brain has gone into a hyper metaphoric state I see metaphors everywhere I look. I also realize that we're not our personalities, so to deal with anything on the level of personality is an illusion. The personality is designed to be a convenience to help us live the life that we want. But it's just software and we're conditioned to think that we are that software. We have this very limited band of personality it would be the equivalent of a singer just singing one note all the time. It would get pretty boring. So it could actually be that we go into map consciousness because the universe is just bored with us. So it's just wanting to play a different song. You can play lots of different songs to one instrument. We're not even playing the same song, we're playing the same note. That would be like saying to be a successful saxophone player would be to play one note the best the mind is undergoing a mutation and everybody needs to transform and what would a manic do they would say how they see it and that's what i'm doing in self-dialogue that's what i've been doing at work a little bit and it's felt more powerful to just speak my truth in one solid hour than perhaps to try to work in the system and smile and nod for the next 10 years. As children, we're in love with life and we fall in love with life. We're love and we are life. And I think map consciousness is just intended to get us to fall in love with life again, to fall in love with our life, our life energy and how it creates. Because if we're creating from the life energy of love, we're gonna create a life that we love. And again, putting things in front of us that we can love unconditionally. And that makes sense in a way because if I was to put a steak in front of me, I can't love that unconditionally because I don't eat that. So it's not something I want to put in front of me. So remaining in the personality, remaining in the ego and seeing all the things we're judging that means we're putting the wrong things in front of us. So at least put something in front of us that we don't feel we need to judge. And that could be an entry point. Map consciousness puts us in touch with a different language. It's the language of love. And that language comes through us like a channel as opposed to the repetition of thought. And it takes a while to understand that language, to have that language deprogram the old thought structure language we have in our head to be just an instrument of the language of the universe.
to speak as the universe, to speak as Gaia, as one, because we're all part of Gaia. And we're the instruments through which Gaia can observe itself and assess its health and go around and see what's happening. I remember watching a movie about Helen Keller and it was showing how as a little girl she had this tutor who was trying to teach her how to do sign language but she couldn't see either so she had to do it in a tactile way and so this tutor was wrestling with the young girl and trying to get her to focus and trying to get her to get what she was trying to do and the little girl must have perceived this woman as a tyrant, as a fiend, as as torturing her. And the woman was very persistent in doing the signs and getting Helen to feel the thing she was signing about, to make the connection between the thing she was feeling and the thing, the language she was trying to teach her in order to be able to communicate. So for that long period of time before it clicked, the tutor was giving her all this context. She was giving her all this context with her hand and touching and hand signing and touching the object and giving her context, context. But it wasn't until a certain point that it clicked for Helen. And when it clicked, she got it and she understood everything that she'd probably touched and, and the signs but it wasn't until it clicked and so there had to be enough context in her brain for it to click. She couldn't just give her one leaf and put her hand and say leaf or however she did it and then oh I get it. That's not how it worked. So it was what am I touching and what is the language associated with that. And when one decouples from the ego process we're being touched by the universe in each moment and we don't really understand what it is that we're we're touching so we're speaking and sometimes we're saying things that seem really off because we're trying to learn this new language we're making connections that aren't necessarily there but they feel like they're there so when they feel like they're there they're probably making those connections of context in our brain even if we aren't speaking the words that are directly perfectly associated with that but maybe we are, maybe we're speaking about these new far off associations and contexts that we wouldn't make otherwise. And we're doing that, and we're unfolding that, and we're creating that context in our brain in the experience of map consciousness. And then we come back and we're medicated or whatever. And if we go back into that, we're making more connections. And the other thing too is that sometimes in this unfolding, as we're walking through map consciousness, it feels like torture. It feels like pain. It feels like punishment. And it feels sort of like that woman must have felt to Helen. She was like, get away from me. Yet she was just this three or four year old or five year old or something. So she didn't understand that it was for her own good, for learning. There's this person like jumping on her and holding her and making her sit down and making her do things she didn't want to do. So it's, to me it's sort of similar to map consciousness because it sort of makes us do things we don't want to do. It makes us see things we don't want to see. It makes us feel things we don't want to feel. And a lot of these things could have been the things that we didn't feel along the way because we were abstracting it away with our minds. So in a way it's a language of reconnecting the body, mind, and heart in order to perceive in a holistic way. But in order to be able to do that, we sort of have to walk through this land of map consciousness, this this reorienting the inner to the outer in order for that to reconnect and to actually get the language of the body, mind, and heart working as one in each moment, which we're not used to. We're used to remaining in the center of our head so much and we don't have access to that full spectrum of our spinal cord and sensation in the different levels just like our voice speaks through different parts it resonates on different part of our spine as we speak depending on the note it's the same with consciousness and since all our consciousness is being directed through the head and through mentation and 
and thinking. We don't have access to this. We think we do because we think about certain aspects, like we might think about sex or something, and we think that actually is is being in that part of our body, but, but it's not because we're abstracting about it. So we're not actually sensitive to that when it actually is there. So for men, they probably think about it all the time, but they're not actually sensitive to when that opportunity is actually there for real. They try to project that and make it real and then a lot of times overstep their boundaries. And then once she understood what the woman was trying to do and she, she understood that language, she loved that woman. She didn't want her to leave. So in the same way, map consciousness, we might actually be able to step into abiding in map consciousness once we've really become sensitive with our body instrument and we can trust ourselves to live in that space. Because it's not a headspace. Of the entire spectrum of reality, most people are living in the headspace. To live in the heart space, it takes a bit more strength in a way, it takes more courage because one is going to see some things that are pretty bothersome. And the thing is too that when that happens a person can no longer participate with that. So if somebody's in a job where there are certain aspects that they find unethical for example, if you exist in the headspace you can still continue to do it. You can rationalize that part that bothers your heart away. You say, well, I make money, or I've been here a long time, or whatever it is. Whereas when you connect with the heart, you can't do that anymore. So connecting with the heart is actually difficult because you have to make changes. So part of map consciousness is connecting with the heart and living in the heart and it's seeing all these things we need to change in ourselves, in the world and and it's difficult because we get to this place where we see all these things that need to change but we can't do anything and at the beginning of it we usually feel like we can do something and then by the end we think we can't and then we get the confirmation that we're just defective so we can't do anything barely at all in life except meander to McDonald's and watch TV so integrating that is about reestablishing that courage to live from the heart. And so the very thing that we think is there to try to torture us, something like so-called psychosis, is actually there to help us see and learn a different language. And I've made a lot of videos since August 6th in the last six and a half months and I feel like so much has changed in life and not much has changed physically really but so much has changed for me contextually and it could be so important to actually create all this context for oneself as oneself speaking as oneself to oneself before actually moving towards anything I don't know if that's true I've been talking to myself and creating this language within myself similar to Helen Keller having that tutor who helped her learn that language of signing and, and tactile touch. It is like we're blind and deaf as human beings. And map consciousness is trying to get us to see. And by talking about what I've seen and what I see from what I've seen, etc., I've been able to create these brain cells, I think. And I've created all this context in my brain. And just as a tree needs a lot of roots to stay strong, it also needs the roots of nearby trees to stay strong. So one tree standing is not as powerful as, as a forest connected together. So it's official, I think. This might now officially be the longest I've managed to stay out of the psych ward. Over eight months.
Yet at the same time, today I've been having some signs that I might want to abort mission, meaning my brain seems to be going into further reaches of its growth that seem too far outside even the context that I'm wanting to create right now. And the other day I talked about, well, maybe I will share some of the weird stuff too. And oddly enough, since I've said that, some of the weird stuff has been coming through me. And I might share some of it just to give examples of things that I don't necessarily want to go further along the lines of. There are thoughts and perceptions that may or may not be true. They might be true in some other context. But if I go into that, then I'm alienating myself too much from the context that I'm creating, which is already beyond how consensus reality would would program us to see things and think about things. So abort mission would equate to taking Seroquel PRN. When I was showering today, I felt a little bit fearful. And it's not because I was showering, it's just I was fearful, but one of my clues is if I'm feeling fearful while I'm showering, while I'm kind of cornered in, then it's a clue that I could dissociate and disconnect and go into a terrified state where all I can do is sit there and wait for help. And that's happened numerous times. So I don't want to get to that point because that would likely mean I need to call for help and then I would be hospitalized and that's the very thing I'm trying to avoid. And I'm wrapping up some things with working in mental health and I'm finding it difficult. So I'm writing a few things and I'm writing from the vantage point I've created for myself through self-dialogue and not through the vantage point of me and my mental illness. Which, before I never really believed, but I still humored that kind of language. So it's, it feels difficult in a way because I feel alone in this context and then I don't want my brain to start creating context that is just so out there. For example, I had something come to me around the whole Ascended Masters thing and I don't even think about that. But it was like, oh, the Ascended Masters can kind of take us over when we get to a certain level of consciousness because we're no longer our ego, so then what are we? Well, maybe we're the Ascended Masters, whatever that means. So, you know, well, that's lovely, but at the same time, I still I still would like to have some semblance of ego self for myself because if I all of a sudden identify with being some kind of Ascended Master, then I might not even speak as myself. And then my family will be confused and probably scared and then that's of no value because then I'll likely be pathologized as 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 not feeling well or something so I don't know if some of those things are like these little clues but then you just walk around and, and smile and nod at that sort of thing and it also told me something like I donated my body to science, as in 
the science that I'm engaged in in terms of seeing and the science of the heart. So it's almost like at a certain point, I'm no longer me and some other aspect of consciousness takes me over and then it's like, well, I've donated my body to science, which can be interpreted in a scary way, like being afraid of death or it can be interpreted as some other element of consciousness is taking me over like I'm being erased or almost I'm erasing myself through this context creation so it could even be the ego fearing that because the ego fears its own death but my ego has died several times and it's always terrifying but then there's some semblance of it left when I get medicated back to reality. So if I don't want to totally lose contact with who I was, perhaps I need to take a Seroquel to slow the process down. Like I said, it likely slows down this brain growth. It, it creates a state of hypoxia in the brain and perhaps allows the oxygen to be diverted back to the ego process because I feel like when the ego feels like it's dying it's because those dopamine circuits are being starved of blood and oxygen so it's not actually dying but it feels like we're dying because that's what happens when we die is that that ego thing dies first so we feel like oh I'm dying but that can happen during life because that's the thing that dies it can die numerous times during life and each time it does part of it is sort of molted from us it's like the ego is something that we're supposed to molt continuously the old skin and the old thoughts and the old ways in in favor of new perception so my new perceptual process has gotten a little bit out there which happens it does happen and now I'm wondering am I able to consciously stop that from happening or can I consciously do it through taking medication because if I end up in the psych ward I'm gonna get medicated anyway extra medicated so these next couple of days I have to be extra watchful and I just wanted to talk about it to myself because this is part of the process, this is part of the learning process. Part of the learning process could be learning to prune one's own insights because that very first time in manic consciousness there were tons of them and a good portion were definitely nonsensical. So right now I'm in a state of learning where I'm able to speak to myself to process some of it, but I'm getting to a point where some of them are maybe things I want to prune out. Maybe they have some element of truth a hundred years in the future or for 10,000 years in the past. Who knows where it's coming from? So it might just be something that I want to consciously prune and not put any energy into that because if I decided to go with that possibility and devote my energy towards that assuming that ascended master consciousness is going to take over my body that is going to be very alienating if I actually take that as a belief so why do we take anything as a belief there's no real difference of taking that as a belief or taking I am ugly as a belief. It's the same thing. So, again, the importance of not believing anything that I say or any insights that come to me. They're just ponderings and wonderings and musings. And that's part of what the brain can do. And to be able to laugh at that instead of take it seriously could be important. I have no idea. I've gotten to this point right now where I'm just like, I don't know, no clue. 
and that's part of the abort mission is if I dull myself out through medication just sort of forgetting most of what I said and, and starting back from the ego again which is the starting point how do you make the butterfly back into a caterpillar reverse metamorphosis I went ice skating yesterday and I was sort of struck by watching a woman try to skate with one of those little helper things that you hang on to and she couldn't skate at all she'd never skated before probably and I've skated for quite a few years so I can skate quite well and I was thinking about how she's learning to travel on a new medium the ice surface with skates on and now if we saw that person and we thought they were walking on the ground we might actually think they were disabled in some way but really it's just about learning to walk on a new medium or learning to skate just like in map consciousness it's learning to walk with a different consciousness learning to walk with a different medium in a different medium and so when one falls flat on their face we think that they're disabled it just means they fell because they're learning to walk in that medium and a person can get up again with a smile on their face and and try again or one can get frustrated and give up and never try again and to me falling out of that higher consciousness is like falling if you're learning to ice skate it's about how we choose to learn after that do we choose to learn with a smile on our face and and wonder and try and celebrate the small gains that we make or do we put up a fuss and give up and being medicated and told that we're disabled for life is the equivalent of somebody else telling us to give up and to stop learning and to not learn about what it was that we just experienced and it's one thing to try and learn about it so if I was learning to ice skate and I fell on my face I could go read a book on how to ice skate or I could try keep trying to ice skate and I could take lessons with somebody who knows so I think the universe is trying to teach us something else to walk in a different way to move about space and time in a different way and just like that woman trying to skate she doesn't have the neural pathways for that balance she doesn't have the neural pathways to move effortlessly on that medium just like we don't have the neural pathways to move effortlessly in that consciousness but we have to practice and and I feel like me doing this self dialogue is the equivalent of what they talk about with visualization how they say if somebody is shooting hoops for basketball or or just visualizing shooting hoops when they get together after practicing either in their mind or for real they both do just as well so for me talking to myself about all of this I feel like it's the equivalent of shooting hoops in my mind I'm practicing shooting hoops with the universe in my mind I'm talking with myself about a different context than the ego context. If I was just talking about the ego context, I'd be talking about my past and I'd be talking about my patterns and I'd be talking about um, different aspects of personality and things like that. And that would only be interesting to a very limited extent. And it's not actually going to grow my brain cells, it's just going to be accessing old memory files that are stored in my brain that are just clogging up my brain that every time I reactivate them they're just continuing to clog up my brain 
it'd be more useful to see that that has no value. Or at least it has very limited value. It might actually be valuable in terms of self-dialogue to remember some memories from the past in order to stay anchored as this person that I think that I am. Because if I start to think I'm not me, that's just going to get me in trouble. And they're going to be like, well, you have to be you, so we're going to medicate you so you think you're you again. And um, that might have some kind of validity. I really don't know. So point being, when I've learned enough about my own brain, it's possible that I don't need to go to the psych ward because I can do to myself what they would do in the psych ward, which is just give Seroquel quick release for 10 days. If I'm aware, and imagine if all of us could get to this point, we wouldn't need psych wards. I think this is sort of the stage that Tom Wooten talks about when he talks about getting to the freedom stage of bipolar, having bipolar in order and being in the freedom stage where we can really be aware of our states and, and modify them if need be or remain in them and remain in order, mainly in order to not alert the public and family that something's up because their interventions are going to be worse than the interventions we can give to ourselves if we're at that phase of awareness. I don't know if that's what his ideas behind it are, but not just that, but it does prevent a lot of unnecessary suffering of of the person in question as well as family members to see a person in a state and feeling like they're out of control and, and needing other whoa I just got really dizzy and I've never had that happen before. I had a total head rush. self-dialogue grows my brain. I don't know if I've grown it too much right now. I did take some extra niacin and theanine and glycine just to keep me calm. I have been taking more vitamin C and the one EMP every day. So it could be something with the EMP too. I guess the main point is to not get freaked out about it. Maybe it was the Ascended Masters. One thing I know for sure is I don't like the smell of my pants. I did a load of laundry and I think I put too much in it and 
and so it didn't really rinse properly, I don't think. So that might have caused it to smell kind of funny when I dried it. I don't know if that's the case, but I might have to change them before I go out. I could be dizzy too because I've been eating a bit less food lately because I haven't been as hungry. This is me trying to find some kind of logical explanation for that. That might have been one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. After skating yesterday, two of my friends and I were looking at this mural, and it was this carved mural, and it was kind of strange. And then one of them said, can't figure out what that is in the top left corner. And it was this weird looking thing, and I said, it's a rock with a wave crashing on it. It's an Ogopogo wearing a costume. I came up with like 10 guesses really quick. And then we kind of laughed it off. And then we were looking at the mural more, and then I looked back, and then I noticed right below this weird blob that we were trying to decipher was a train and so it was actually the smoke of the train and I laughed and I was thinking about how it's funny because if we don't look at the whole picture we can really wonder what something is about but then when we look at the whole picture it makes sense have to look at the whole picture not just at bits of information if we don't look at the whole picture, what we're talking about doesn't make any sense. So that could be the thing in map consciousness as well. As we're talking about stuff, we're not really making sense because we haven't yet seen the whole picture. And sometimes when we get to the end where we can see the whole picture, we realize we don't want to see it all. And I guess that's what the ego is for, is blocking from us from seeing what's really happening. Here's another, here's another extrapolation I'd rather not entertain. Though it could be entertaining, it could make a good movie. I had this sense that we were here as human beings on planet Earth, as animals, as human animals, and then aliens sent thoughts through the universe to infect our brains. And then through that, we were able to build the society as we have, but really we're actually building this society and all these structures for the aliens. So then they eventually come here and just kill us all and they live in everything that we build. Sort of like how some insects do that. They just, they're parasitic and they, they, they use whatever in order to build something for them and then they just take it over. Again, good movie script, not something that I want to devote my life to. And it's not just that we play the notes of the saxophone, it's how we play them. So I could say, the world is unconditional love, or I could say the world is unconditional love. I feel like I'm having a growth spurt into the mind. Mm -hmm. And the mind is using the brain to create itself. The mind is using the brain to create the mind. So it has to create the brain cells in order for that to happen. So it's brain cell growth. I feel like lithium might provide some kind of capacitance for this because it's positively charged and the energy going through the brain in terms of electricity is electrons or negative charge. And I've read that lithium causes the brain to grow, the gray matter to grow. And I had a weird insight about that, that likely the people who are taking lithium, who they study, their brains are already growing. So 
they study them and they say it's the lithium. But in my theory, the brain growth process has been initiated by the universe, by consciousness, by natural selection, by the universe needing people to actually use the rest of their brains besides their ego prefrontal cortex. And so their brains are already growing and then they're diagnosed with bipolar or something and given lithium. Then their brains are studied and said to grow because lithium made it grow. Now, they might have done some kind of controls to, to prove that, but maybe other people's brains were growing as well, but maybe they were on different medication that suppressed the brain growth. So I don't really care to look into the studies because that's that would take too much time. I just sort of thought of reversing what they say. The lithium causes the brain to grow. People who get put on lithium likely had this brain growth process initiated and that's why they went into map consciousness and then were diagnosed as defective. How can they be defective when their brains are growing? But it's attributed to the lithium. Oh, what a miracle. I don't know about that. Because the True Hope product, the EMP, their studies have shown that that their product helps the brain to grow too. So maybe again their product's being taken by people who who their brains are growing, but they did it on rats actually, so it's hard to say with that. Maybe their product actually does make the brain grow in lithium. Maybe it does too, who knows, but it could also be that the brain wants to grow. So if it's given some kind of positive charge mineral, whether it's lithium or whether it's all the spectrum of minerals in the True Hope product, it's going to grow because it needs that, that charge in order to grow those brain cells. And it needs the charge to be distributed through the whole brain. So that stuff probably goes to other areas of the brain, which then can divert electricity there, plus negatively charged oxygen, and actually get those brain cells to grow. And I was thinking about how creating lots of new brain cells through the vibration of one's voice, talking to oneself, seeing something new, and giving it a voice could almost be a buffer in a way to some of the other stuff. So I've had a few weird thoughts lately, but since I've created so much other context, it's difficult for my brain to go off on that tangent without having the buffer of other brain cells with lots of other context. So if I had a few weird thoughts and I didn't have the context that I've created for myself, I might think, oh, it's my mental illness, oh, and then I get scared, and then that would make it worse, and then the next fearful thought would come, and the next, and the next, and the next but I've been able to sort of be like, oh, that's not actually something that I wanna go down the path of, just like I wouldn't wanna go down the path of being medicated or pathologized again. And so the context helps with that again too, because it doesn't allow my brain to get caught in that story that I've been told about myself. And just like right now here, there's a lot of snow on the ground, so it actually, stops the sound it's not so noisy from the traffic because it's buffering that the buffer of all the context of brain cells that i might have created for myself prevents the noise of other people's stories and interpretations coming in to infect my brain it's buffered with probably a lot more glial cells and so i can't get stuck in any other neuronal tracks of thought patterns that society would infect me with. And if I don't have the buffer of all that extra sound cells in my brain, of all these other things that I've talked to myself about, if some other thought comes in, it's going to sound a lot louder because it's like this hollow brain with nothing. And if something comes in, it pings around and it's like, whoa, that's so disturbing. Whereas if I have all this other context, it'll just be a slight whisper and it'll just be like, oh, whatever. 
So I feel like the brain is trying to grow out of the ego and is trying to grow out of fear as well. I feel like that could be why people have loud voices in their head because it's just one thought coming from somewhere else apparently and it's just bouncing around in the brain and we've never been taught to engage ourselves in really wondering what that's all about and and some people have started to do that and as they do and as they develop more and more understanding for themselves about how they choose to understand it or how other people have helped them to understand it those voices aren't as loud I don't know if that means not as loud in volume or they're just not taken as seriously because there's other understanding and context to hold those painful bits or disturbing bits and it's not like there's never going to be anything disturbing but it'll be less disturbing if one has really engaged one's own brain around it and it wants us to pay attention to something other than our ego voice whether it's a voice as somebody else's voice or just seeing something and having an insight it's a different voice than the ego and it could be just showing us that we're not our ego because if we were we wouldn't be able to have thoughts in someone else's voice or things like that in our head the mind is bigger than the brain the mind is the entire field of what's available and we can't see all of it so the mind is helping us to move into seeing more of the mind <laughs>